the hell is going on? What's really going on? We said, what the hell happened? You don't have to know what the hell is on it. They, they see what's going on. I don't know what's going on. What is going on? We must find out what is going on. Hi, I'm Danielle Zetka. And I'm Mark Thiessen. Welcome to our podcast, What the Hell is Going On? Mark, <laughs> what the hell is going on? That was very dramatic. I know, I was really, really feeling <laughs> you, it. You have to say it differently every time. What the hell is going on? Give it a little more listeners. spirit, Danny. I want our listeners to wonder what they're getting each time. Oh, and by the way, we're supposed to remember, hey, guys who are listening, please subscribe review, send this to your friends, and do all of those good things that help our podcast get to more and more people so that Mark and I can be famous. <laughs> I, I, I support that sentiment. What the hell is going on is somebody assassinated the head of the Iranian nuclear program. Before we get into the implications of that and why this happened now and all the rest of it, let's just take a moment to reflect on the James Bond-like details of this assassination. I mean, of course, we don't know for sure how this happened or who did it, though we have our suspicions as to who did it. But the story is coming out that it was apparently, the, or allegedly the Israelis, that they used a remote controlled machine gun in a Nissan truck that was parked in a roundabout when the head of this Iranian nuclear program was coming out. It was packed with explosives. And so they allegedly used a satellite to guide the remote machine gun and then blew up the truck after the guy was assassinated. There's some people who speculate that doing it so entirely remotely would have been unlikely, that they wouldn't have had anybody on the ground participating. And certainly there were people on the ground setting this up, getting the, uh, the weapons and all the technology into Iran over a period of time. But this literally, it's like a scene out of a Bond movie. When you see things happening that you say, that could really happen in real life, it apparently just did, and Fakhrizadeh is no more. Yeah, I got to say, I don't mourn any of these guys, and I want to talk about the politics around who is actually mourning them, but you are totally right. I mean, the fact that the Israelis have these capabilities, I mean, whoever did it, but maybe the Israelis have these capabilities. We'll just assume for our sake of the podcast that the Israelis did it and leave it to them to deny it's, it's absolutely stunning. It really is. Uh, and we've basically seen two major storylines. One, that there were at least a dozen operatives on the ground who were involved in pulling Fakhrizada out of the car and then shooting him uh, or uh, getting in a gun battle with his security guards. But then another version of the story where there's absolutely nobody there except this satellite controlled machine gun. Can I just say I need a satellite controlled machine gun? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't everyone? <laughs> well, the Biden no, administration just... is going to ban those too, Danny. So, you know, oh, the, 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 your, your Second Get Amendment rights you... are being taken away. Get yours while you can. But <laughs> the technology behind this, the knowledge, the planning, the fact that they knew where he was and when he was visiting his summer house, the Iranian version of his dacha outside Tehran, and that they could get him at a time and a place of their choosing is absolutely incredible. I mean, I would watch the, that movie. On the 10-year anniversary of the assassination of another Iranian nuclear right. scientist. So, I mean, literally, not just the time of their choosing, but like literally the time of their choosing. Like, not just we can get you anytime we want, but they literally planned this to send a message to all Iranian nuclear scientists that we basically can pick you off at will. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the reality is, like, I guess that the Israelis, if it was indeed the Israelis, can. I was about to say, I would totally watch that movie if Daniel Craig was in it. <laughs> <laughs> but let's talk a little bit about the fallout. We're going to talk with our guests about some of the technical issues and who Fefazetta was and what he did and about the Iranian nuclear program. So let's you and I talk politics for a second. Sure. There have been a spate of what I can only label these graceful stories, including my personal favorite from John Brennan. And here you can assume that my epithet has been edited out, bleeped out. Um, <laughs> oh, say it. We've got an explicit rating. No, because it's that bad. You know, this is a former senior Obama administration official who was stopped the head of the CIA. And who was soft on Iran then, who was soft on Hezbollah, 
who was soft on all of these guys. And he goes out and calls this an act of terrorism. I mean, WTF. Absolutely. And here's the thing also, is that, first of all, he led an agency that engages in all sorts of covert operations that are violations of international law. That's by definition what a covert operation is. Not to speak of extrajudicial killings with drones. I'm sorry. Yes. Now, <laughs> now what he says, he anticipated your line of attack and said that there's a difference because we were taking out people who were uh, members of Al-Qaeda in the Islamic State, which are non-state actors and are terrorist organizations and unlawful combatants. However, Fakhrizideh, the, the Iranian nuclear scientist, was a general in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is a designated terrorist organization because of the Trump administration so designated it. So basically, there is no legal difference between taking out the head of the Iranian nuclear program or, for that matter, Qasem Soleimani, the head of the Quds Force, uh, who was killed by the Trump administration, and taking out the second in command of al-Qaeda, who also happened to be in Tehran. Why was that? And that's something that you and I are going to be exploring a lot in the next year, the Iran-Al-Qaeda connection, or taking out Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. So the idea that the former head of the CIA would label this an act of terrorism when it's a lawful covert action, similar to what the United States does all the time, carried out by the United States' closest ally in the region against our sworn enemy, the, the Islamic terrorist Republic of Iran, just shows the depths of hatred for this administration that, you know, you literally drives you to such distraction that you side with Iran against Israel and the United States. Well, I mean, come on, that's the hallmark of pretty much all the Obama administration officials. They became Iran's lawyer, Iran's advocate and everything else. And shame on them. But and oh, by the I way, wanna, can yeah. I just jump in? You know, there were a number of Iranian nuclear scientists who met their mysterious end during the Obama years. Right. There were several of them who were killed when President Obama was in office, presumably by the same actors who were involved in this and presumably with the same, at least if not coordination or cooperation, at least implicit approval of the United States. So oh, well, that, you know, that's a level where of you're hypocrisy wrong. here too. Oh, am that's I? That's where you're wrong. Yes, because in fact, it was the Obama administration that went to the Israeli government and leaned on them to stop getting rid of Iran's nuclear scientists because it was complicating Obama's efforts to help them, quote unquote, end their nuclear weapons program. So there's that travesty. Then there's travesty number two, people who are supposedly journalists writing for outlets, you know, like the New York Times, who suggest that this was all political, that basically in their unbelievable America centrism, they believe that everything happens with a view to either helping or hurting Donald Trump, you know, because he is, after all, the reason why we all get up in the morning and why the sun rises. And they theorizing that Israel or whoever did it conducted this unbelievably complex, unbelievably sophisticated operation in order to stymie the Biden administration as it goes forward to try to recapitulate to the Iranians in the Middle East. I mean, it is beyond ludicrous to suggest that the Israelis don't have an independent agenda and that they planned this when they knew already that Biden was going to win the election. I mean, it's just it, it beggars belief. You're right in the sense that you, this could not have been planned starting in November of this year because just the complexity of getting the operatives into Iran, the getting the equipment involved into Iran, storing it, hiding it, planning out the method, all the rest, it could, that could have been happened in a, in a matter of weeks. This was an operation that had to take years in the planning. Also, you know, Israel is acting in its own interest. And as I recall, they didn't really have much of a say in uh, the Obama administration's diplomacy with Iran. And so when they see those people coming back in and professing that they are going to bring back the Iranian nuclear deal and start us up where we were in 2016, despite all the developments that have taken place in the last four years, I know they want to close their eyes and pretend Trump never happened, but a lot did happen with, with regard to Tehran. A lot of leverage was built up, a lot of good things that were happened to put Iran in its box. They it would be perfectly legitimate to be worried about that and uh, to take this shot at a time when there was an administration that was willing to say, go ahead, we're fine with it, as opposed to someone that was going to punish them or, or give them trouble for doing so. We, we've become so unhinged in this country, we can't have a normal conversation about anything. 
nonetheless, there's a ton to understand here. There's a lot about this guy and about the Iranian nuclear program that I think people don't know or aren't paying close attention to. And because this really is an absolutely fascinating story, but one that also gives us a window into just how sophisticated and ongoing the Iranian nuclear weapons program is, notwithstanding sanctions, notwithstanding the warm efforts of the Europeans to reassure their Iranian friends that once a Democrat is back in the White House, all will be well. There's been a ton of advances, even under the Trump administration. And we've got David Albright, who is the founder of This is my favorite Twitter name, actually. He's the founder of the Institute for Science and International Security, the acronym of which is ISIS. But their Twitter (laughs) name... The good ISIS. But but their Twitter name is the good ISIS, exactly, which is so terrific. He's got an unbelievable uh, background, but he is actually uh, a scientist. He has a master's of science in physics and in mathematics. And so he really comes at this from the technical non-proliferation side for those of but you But there will who don't be no know, math in the podcast in case you're worried. This is all <laughs> oh he my is, God. is really interesting guy and the world leading expert on this nuclear program. Yes, God, I should have said that. Whenever I say math, people on math will, will probably hang up as I would. But yeah, <laughs> no, no, no. Knows the program backwards and forwards, has advised Democrats, Republicans, and pretty much everybody in between on this. Uh, you guys are going to love this conversation. Here's our talk with David Albright. <laughs> David, welcome to the podcast. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So, I mean, the world has been rocked by this news that the uh, the father of the Iranian bomb, Moshin Fakhrizadeh, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, has been assassinated in Tehran. Just tell our listeners first just the basics, like who is this guy and why is this such a significant event? Well, one is he's he's a bit of a mysterious person. I mean, he's he's had an extremely important role in Iran's nuclear program for decades and, and rarely been visible. He was the kind of the head of the Iranian crash nuclear weapons program called Plan Ahmad uh, that ran from about 1999 to 2003. And he implemented this pretty massive project to build the infrastructure to make nuclear weapons, including making uh, weapon grade uranium. So it was a, a very large nuclear program. His program was ended due to international pressure and and the fact that the United States was sitting next door in Iraq in 2003, and Iran felt very threatened overall and shut down the plan Ahmad, something that made Fakhrizadi extremely angry. And he was able to continue the program with the approval of the leadership. So it was a, a downsized nuclear weapons program without an order to build nuclear weapons, but to carry on, keep the people employed, continue projects that in some cases create a civilian cover for them, some cases keep them covert. And he's been doing that since 2003. And organizational names change over time. I mean, the most recent version had the acronym of SPND. He grew his organization. It grew from a just a nuclear weapons program, which is not a small thing, but it grew into something that's a little bit like the U.S. DARPA, that he created a, a research branch in the Ministry of Defense that did the research for advanced weapon systems, advanced technology, and in a sense had grown quite a bit budgetary-wise and in influence. One of his colleagues said the other day on um, Iranian TV, ministers of defense came and went. Fakhrizadi was always there as a deputy defense minister. So, David, first of all, thank you for being with us. I have a a lot of things I want to ask you. But to contextualize how important Fakhrizadeh is to the Iranian nuclear program, I think it would be great for our listeners to get a sense of a politics-free, something that we almost never are able to get here in D.C., a politics-free sense of where the Iranian nuclear weapons program actually is right now. Well, it's, it's very hard to determine that. I mean, my own work, I conclude that Iran has not decided to build nuclear weapons. And I, and I think that's, I think there's a lot of governments who share that view. I think that there's a program there to be ready to build nuclear weapons. It's a program where if the order comes from up on high, they want to be able to 
produce the weapon-grade uranium relatively quickly. They also want to be able to produce nuclear weapons relatively quickly. And that's no small feat. I mean, this isn't readiness like a, a latent proliferation like a Japan that has separated plutonium and has enrichment plants. I mean, this is a program that probably thought through how long do we want to take to build these weapons and, and what type do we want? It may be that they only want to test one underground. I would say that if they made that decision today, they probably could test a nuclear weapon underground in six to nine months. If they wanted to put it on a ballistic missile, it's probably going to take them significantly longer. One of the things that happened in Plan Ahmad was while it was racing ahead, it didn't finish its work on creating a deliverable, reliable warhead for the, at that time, the Shahid-3 missile. So I think they need more time on that, although we don't really know what they've been doing the last 20 years. They may have made considerable progress on that question without us being, without people like me knowing that. But the bottom line is, is that the program I think is very dangerous. These kind of readiness programs are quite dangerous and they're not latent proliferation programs, but programs to be able to build the bomb within a relatively short period of time. And while they wouldn't classify under some intelligence communities assessments of an active nuclear weapons program, in my definition, it would still be a nuclear weapons program that is, is very threatening to, to US interests. And so understanding that, how integral was Fakhrizade to the program's continued success? He was the manager. His specialty was nuclear, nuclear calculations, nuclear measurements, radiation measurements. But what he brought to the table was, was his managerial skills, that he had been running these programs for decades before his death. He was viewed very highly in the Iranian defense establishment. And colleagues have been talking about him over the last several days on Iranian TV. And he, you know, he just had a, a very good management style. He was a very good planner. Um, he was deeply involved in developing the entire nuclear plan as they call it on TV, but it, in the 1990s. And that, what they're talking about is the plan to create Natanz, the Ahmad plan, you know, everything Iran's been doing on nuclear. He was the brains behind that. And, and, and again, he, did, he didn't sit down and write it, but he organized it. And so his loss, is, I think, is pretty severe. In a lot of these developing world countries, in some ways, the, the difference between success and failure is the management of the program. I spent a lot of time studying the Iraqi nuclear weapons program that existed up to 91. And it's, it was suffering because of management weaknesses. Fakhrizadi, I think his gift was management. And, and I think he was, he's deserves much of the credit for the fact that Iran has been able to put together these centrifuge programs and nuclear weapons program, missile programs. I mean, he was involved in many areas of defense research and development. And I think that he, he was, uh, as, as the Iranian government and, and officials are making clear, he was a, a revered scientist in Iran who'd made tremendous contributions to the Iranian um, defense establishment. So his assassination uh, has been compared to the killing of Soleimani in the sense that they were, you know, Soleimani was the driving force between Iran's effort at regional hegemony, and the Fakhrizadeh was the lead driving force behind Iran's nuclear weapons program. And the point has been made that their positions can be filled, but they can't be replaced. Is that a fair assessment? I think it's it's not a bad assessment. I mean, the trouble I have, and I think others have with uh, Fakhrizadeh and his organization, SPND, it's hard to know the people in the program. They surround themselves or try to with secrecy and finding out their names can be very challenging. And so I think I would equate the two. I mean, Fakhrizadeh was a brigadier general in the Revolutionary Guard. Um, he was a deputy defense minister. So he's, in a sense, he's at a comparable level to Soleimani. And, and I think his presence will be missed. Now, the way I would think about it is there's quite a bit of that is established by the Iranian nuclear weapons program, particularly based on what they did in, in Plan Ahmad and then what of what they did, what we know about after that. So I think if, if the question was produce a, a nuclear explosive device, I mean, I, I think many people in Iran could manage that program and they could detonate a bomb in the desert somewhere in, in um, six to nine months. Where I think 
Fakhrizadeh may be more missed is the plan to create a reliable, deliverable nuclear weapon mounted on a missile. So there's a lot more engineering skill and expertise that has to go in that. There's many more different parts of the Iranian defense establishment that have to be involved in making that work. And he demonstrated during Plan Ahmad that he was able to do that. He headed the entire nuclear weapons program, soup to nuts, I mean, that expression still exists, but he, he was managing the whole thing. And in the reconstitution, the pieces kind of went off on their own. And so he, someone has to pull those back together. And I think that that's where he could be missed and they, and they may have a, a challenge. And the other part of it is, is that here's a guy with, who's been 22 years basically doing the same thing programmed up and down during that time, but he's, his colleagues on TV are saying 22 years and he's doing the same thing. He had tremendous influence and good relations with the, the Iranian military and defense bureaucracy and was viewed as, as someone at the very highest levels of that bureaucracy. So who can step into that and manage? I mean, scientists everywhere, engineers can be pretty feisty and pretty difficult to rope in, in a sense. I, I think that his loss is a real blow to the program. Well, that's good news. So I'm not uh, as immersed in, in this uh, issue uh, as you are. Where I first came across Mahsen Fakhrizadeh was when he was cited, Mark is shaking his head at me because I pronounced his name properly. Um, <laughs> you know, but if we're Americans here. Damn it, get an American name. Uh, like John Kerry saying, Genghis Khan. It is Genghis Khan, <laughs> to be fair. But, <laughs> but that's another issue. But where I first came across him was when uh, he was cited in North Korea uh, as an observer at one of North Korea's nuclear tests. So apparently he also, not in addition to being a great manager, apparently he was playing some sort of transnational role in if I may use this expression without fear of retribution in the axis of evil in cooperating over nuclear issues. Do you think that's still something that goes on? Is it something, tell us what you know. Well, it's a, it's a, actually, it's a big question. I mean, Fakhrizadeh traveled a lot. He got a lot of benefit for his program um, and other nuclear programs in Russia in 2000, when they, they were just beginning to build the nuclear weapons infrastructure, they decided that some of the facilities would be um, underground facilities and they, they needed help. They, they appealed to the Quds Force who set them up with some very important meetings in a, a foreign country. I don't know where that was. It wasn't North Korea. I mean, a, probably a better guess would be Lebanon with Hezbollah. It was recommended they use that country's companies to buy equipment for the Iranian um, effort to build their own underground nuclear weapons production sites. So he also, there, there's, um, there was a very good reporting in Süddeutsche Zeitung back in 2011 about um, cooperation between the nuclear weapons people and the North Koreans, where the North Koreans were going to provide help on computer codes, and, but more importantly, on the kind of data that you put into it and the, uh, the, that you need nuclear weapons related data. And North Koreans came and, and, and spent several months educating the Iranians in the program on uh, use of the codes as applied to using actual or more realistic uh, nuclear weapons data. So I think that Fakhrizadeh had always had a philosophy to reach out and benefit from foreign cooperation. He certainly had to acquire a lot of equipment overseas and had to manage illicit procurement schemes. And he's really, in a sense, one way to think about him too is, is he likes, I, I'm projecting, but he would, have, he would have been a person who doesn't object to the sanctions. The sanctions allowed him to build up his organization as part of a resistance economy. And, and so I don't think he'd have any problems budding up to um, North Korea. Uh, certainly he's part of the IRGC. He's gonna, they had relations with the Quds Force. And, and I think other enemies in the United States would, could very well be his friends. So one of the speculations as to why now 
is uh, first obviously been reported, though not confirmed, that Israel was behind the, the assassination. So speculation as to why they did it and why now, obviously one was to set back the nuclear program. But the other one, other reason that has been speculated is to uh, to box in the Biden administration, which is coming back into power and has stated that they want to return to the Iran nuclear deal. Do you think that that was an objective of this? And you've written that from whatever you think of Trump and you didn't like that he left uh, that he left the nuclear deal. He's generated an enormous amount of leverage on Iran and he's called it a gift to Biden. There's this fear that the Biden team, which is really the Obama team, will come in and try to pick up where they left off in 2016. Do you think that would be a mistake? Yeah, in fact, I was quoted in a recent story that I think would be crazy if they rejoin the deal, given the amount of leverage that's been generated. But in answer to your question, I think certainly they, whoever did this was thinking through consequences and had to be thinking that you know this will affect the Biden administration. But I, but I think these kind of operations take a long time to plan. One of his colleagues, uh, close colleagues on Iranian TV, said that he was kind of set back that it was ten. Uh, the assassination was ten years to the to within one day of the assassination of another major Iranian nuclear scientist, and he thinks that was deliberate. So there aren't many anniversaries of, of the assassination of Iranian scientists, and he thinks who's ever doing this is so able to penetrate. Iranian security that they can pick the date that they want to do this within, you know, plus or minus one day. You know, he had an interesting view of this. He'd also, there had been an assassination attempt against him. He'd survived, a guy named Dr. Abbasi Devani. And, you know, he's known Fakhrizadeh for, I don't know, 30 years or more. And he said that one of the impacts of, of this is that isn't well recognized, I think, in I would, I'm adding to hit his words, didn't recognize well in the West is, is that it, it really demoralizes the people in the, in the effort. I mean, it's kind of obvious. In fact, the demoralization, I think, is directly proportional to how much the Iranian leadership says this will never interfere. We will march forward steadily into the future. This will have no impact. I think inside, it's the opposite. And, and they work very hard to try to overcome that. And that this idea that they can kill these people on anniversaries of previous assassinations, which brings it all back, that the memory of that assassination, they can pick religious holidays, is very upsetting to the inside of the Iranian defense establishment. And in that sense, I think this thing, this was planned quite a while ago, and Trump could have been the victor. So I think they probably would have done this regardless of the election and, and did, I think, do it regardless of the election. And, and, and certainly they have to, whoever did it has to worry about the impact on, on what the Biden people will do. They also have to worry about the impact of what Iran's gonna do. Do you think if, even if they planned it regardless of the election that the timing might've been fortuitous because you're now on the cusp of this transition to a much more Tehran friendly group of people who will be leading our foreign policy who really want to return to diplomacy. And so Iran is sort of in a vice because on one hand, they want to retaliate. But if they do retaliate, then uh, it will prevent, uh, depending on how they do it, it could prevent the Biden team from doing what they want and what the Iranians want, which is to return to the deal and lift sanctions and achieve a lot of objectives. So in a way, timing this now could mean that whoever did this is getting away with it without the kind of repercussions that might have happened under other circumstances. Is that fair? Yeah, no, I think that's fair. I think the Iranians also know, too, that they don't know when the next one's happening. I'm writing a book on the Iranian nuclear weapons program and with a, my co-author, Andrea Stricker. There's documents in the nuclear archive where they're planning how to continue the program after the, the halting of the Ahmad plan. And they're going through and trying to figure out you know, how well they've done to, in a sense, taking stock, what, what are the holes they'll need to fill in the future? And, and there, were, there were five central characters in that meeting. Three of them are now dead from assassination. A fourth was almost assassinated. And the fifth is now heading a, one of the Iranian universities. So, so I think they're, they have to worry a great deal about the next, in a sense, shot or explosion. And they know that if they start negotiations, probably that country will not do those kinds of explosions or assassinations. So that's another side to this is that these actions can 
act to encourage the Iranians to accept negotiations in, in lieu of uh, retaliation. Mark mentioned uh, the operation. And again, there, there have been a number of stories about them. For anybody who's watched the, the Apple TV series, Tehran, this Israeli series, all of the stories are very reminiscent of this set of TV episodes about you know a Mossad operation directed against the Iranian nuclear program that goes wrong and how the, the Mossad team uh, operates on the ground. But you know, I stopped and I had a look without reading out all their names, we've got, you know, a killing in January of 2007, January of 2010, November 2010, November 2010, July 2011, January 2012, and now Fakhrizadeh in 2020. I mean, that's an amazing record that whoever, probably the Israelis, maybe with American help, have in Iran. It's quite incredible. And it has to have set back their programs, uh, you know, pretty seriously in each instance. Well, and it's also in, 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 in the commentary on TV recently, there were more assassination attempts that didn't happen. There was an attempt on Fakhrizadeh, according to this, in this case, it's Abbasi Devani, in 2008. He says there was an attempt on him in 2000 and around 2006. So I think the, this has been going on for a long time. And I think whoever is doing it, is getting better. I have to say, if ever I wanted to know to know state secrets, this this would be a, a moment in which I did. So let's just circle back to the JCPOA a second. You told Mark that you know you think it would be crazy to rejoin as is. If you had to encapsulate what it is that you think that an incoming, eager to rejoin an improved JCPOA Biden administration would do, what are the key elements that they need to address? I think, you know, and I had a, I had a look at this pretty intensely and, and, uh, and supported the Trump administration's effort to fix the deal. And they didn't accept everything that I and colleagues had recommended, but one critical thing that was more or less accepted was we have to know, is, is this a nuclear program that's peaceful or does it have a hidden nuclear weapons side to it? And so the International Atomic Energy Agency really has to first before there's any deal, come forth and say, look, you know, we've certified this program as peaceful. And they've never done that. They've, they've actually said the opposite over and over again. And they're currently locked in a conflict with Iran over activities involving undeclared nuclear materials at former Ahmad clan sites. And, and if it's undeclared uranium, even if it's 20 years ago, it's still undeclared uranium. Where is it? Why did they have it? And so are they still using it? And so the IA is in a conflict now, and that needs to be resolved. The other thing is I've come to the position that I think given the, the if you can't fully resolve the IA issue, you've got to end enrichment, that it, it's got to be zero enrichment. I mean, you can't have this partial enrichment. And, 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 and the JCPO is, has shown this. Very easy to replace the LEU stocks, the enriched uranium stocks. They've got enough now for two bombs if it was further enriched to weapon grade. So they didn't even do very much and they have enough for two bombs and they can, their breakout times have come down to about you know, three to four months to get enough weapon grade uranium for a bomb. So the JCPOA is just too unstable. Really quickly, I mean, that's a non-starter. You know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of the folks who negotiated the JCPOA and, and I believe that they actually could have gotten a much better deal out of the Iranians even within the context in which it was negotiated. But setting that aside, I don't think even the world's greatest negotiators without sort of a, a genuine sort of Damocles hanging over Tehran, you know, you're either gonna all be bombed or, or you do this, that Iran is gonna to agree to, to ending enrichment. Isn't that right? Well, that's been their position since 2006. So, I mean, that, that's true. And, but their position also is not to allow any inspectors into military sites and that they haven't fully stuck to that. So, again, I agree with you. Maybe what you can do is have the sunsets on the nuclear limitations last much longer. But I think you still then, if you're going to do that, have to get to the bottom. Is this a military or a peaceful nuclear program? So, David, exit question for me. So, you know, we've had the killing of Soleimani, the killing of the Iran, head of the Iranian nuclear program. You just had an assassination of uh, a senior al-Qaeda leader in Tehran. 
Uh, we've had the maximum pressure campaign on Iran that has uh, that has really crippled their economy. In, just in a broader sense, you know, we're about to have a transition from the Trump administration to the Biden administration. So, how do you assess the Trump Iran policy overall and its success in success or not or lack thereof in setting back the, the Iranian threat to the region and I know everyone rejects anything that Donald Trump does, but are there things that Trump was doing that merit continuation under the new administration? Well, certainly one of the things the Trump administration did was kind of get this U.S. financial and other types of sanctions out of kind of this cabinet that they've been put in by the JCPOA so they could be applied on, on missiles, terrorism, you know, regional aggression. And, and I think those sanctions should continue and be increased if Iran continues to down the paths that it's been on and not to in any way lock them all up again under some kind of nuclear rubric. So I think sanctions need to continue. And the nuclear issue is important, but it's not the only one there. And I think the Trump administration created a policy that is did a much better job at confronting Iran's um, malign, I hate to use their word, but let me do it. It's shorthand malign behavior in the in the entire region and across its entire scope. And, and I think that they should be commended for. I think where they had problems was they really didn't have a plan once they left the deal to get a new deal. And I think that's created a whole set of problems. But I think the end point is they've created a lot of leverage on Iran. And, and also things have been happening below the surface in a, of a military conflict uh, of explosions of nuclear sites and, and assassinations that have ramped up the leverage in a sense even more. It also shows that if the people in the region are not included in a deal, they may do things on their own that may not be in the interest of the Biden administration, but may very well be in, in their interests. That was actually my, my exit question for you. Uh, I, uh, I was speaking to a group yesterday and I said, you know, when, when America steps back, when America advantages Iran, our allies in the region often do things that are not good for our interests and sometimes not good for their own interests. So I hope that's not what we have to look forward to. But you've been wonderful, super generous with your time and just fascinating. I hope we will be able to talk about this again as, as the Biden administration settles in and we understand the fallout from this assassination and uh, see where all these things are going. Okay, no, happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. It was great. So Danny, you uh, brought David Albright to us and, and he didn't disappoint. He is just a uh, really insult guy. Let's talk about what, where we ended off with him, about the, you know, an assessment of the Trump administration's Iran policy and particularly with regard to this. I mean, if you think about what's been accomplished in the last four years, first of all, just the imposition of crippling sanctions, the elimination of Qasem Soleimani, who literally probably next to Osama bin Laden was the most maligned terrorist in the modern Middle East, the assassination of the head of the nuclear program, which is going to set back their efforts significantly, uh, the assassination of the top al-Qaeda operative just recently in Tehran as well, the taking out of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, real blows against both Sunni and Shia extremism, and of course, the elimination of the, the caliphate. Where do you assess where we are? And, you know, I know the Biden administration, they, it, there's this reflexive thing on the left that anything Trump did must be bad, and therefore we have to reverse it. And that's not necessarily true when it comes to Iran. He's actually handed, going beyond the nuclear program, three Arab-Israeli peace accords, uh, you know, first, first peace accords in the region, which has happened because he repudiated the Obama approach, which was that all peace has to go in the, in the region, require detente with Iran and go through Ramallah. So they've really inherited a situation in the Middle East that they could take advantage of if they don't go about reversing everything. Is that fair? I do think it's fair. And I think the challenge is this, you know, what the Democrats are going to keep saying is, it keeps saying to me in particular is, you know, you know, Tony Blinken, Tony is a great guy. And I know Tony Blinken and Tony Blinken is a great guy. The problem for me is not Tony Blinken or, or even, you know, Joe Biden, you know, you know, Joe Biden, he was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He's not a crazed nut job. And I think all of that is true. The problem for us really going forward is where the Democratic Party is, because the Democratic Party has gone from being a pro-Israel 
party to a pro-Iran party. And that's obviously an unbelievably vast overgeneralization. There are many, many people inside the Democratic Party who remain pro-Israel. But its leading lights and its loudest voices have in fact on foreign policy become these other people. And that's what I worry about. I worry about this desire to satisfy them and this deranged anti-Trumpism. You know, if Trump did it, it must be bad. And of course the answer is for Biden, he's kind of in the catbird seat. He's got a lot of opportunities. He's got a lot of leverage on Iran and he should use it. I worry that beyond that top level of, you know him, you like him, there are going to be people who I do know and don't like and don't trust who are naive in the extreme about what Iranian ambitions are in the region, who are naive in the extreme about the balance of power in the region, and who are so deranged on the topic of Saudi Arabia because of the Khashoggi killing that they cannot see straight and believe that Iran is actually a better ally for the United States in the region than Saudi Arabia. Well, this is a larger problem with the Biden presidency in general, and we'll we'll be spending lots of time assessing it in the in the coming year as it as it unfolds. Is that you've got this? It's true in domestic policy. It's true on on everything, which is that he doesn't represent the Democratic Party as it exists today. He arrived in Washington in 1972. He was a Scoop Jackson Democrat. He was a tough on the Soviets. He and Jesse Helms, uh, when when the Ford administration wouldn't allow Alexander Solzhenitsyn to come to Washington, they invited him and held events with him. I mean, he's not a crazy left-wing democratic socialist economically or on foreign policy. But the party that he leads, it's I've described it as a, it's like a nice walnut veneer on the uh, fiber board of democratic socialism that is the foundation of the modern democratic party today. And it's going to be very hard for him to push back on all of that because that's not where his constituency is, whether it's domestically or wh- or whether it's on foreign policy, uh, and certainly when it comes to Iran. No, I agree with you. But if we can see some effort on the part of you know Republicans on Capitol Hill to try to continue to encourage the Biden administration to actually use that leverage productively. You know, you could see the building of a real bipartisan alliance on national security policy. That would be awesome. Uh, I don't know whether the Nancy Pelosi's and Chuck, Chuck Schumer's, let alone the Bernie's and the AOC's and the Elizabeth Warren's, allow that to happen. And, you know, I think the Iranians are going to be watching very, very closely. I'm less concerned about their ability to retaliate in a serious way against the Israelis and much more concerned about what it is that this new administration is going to do in order to try to get back into the deal. And, you know, again, this isn't going to be just us. It's going to be us and the Europeans. And hopefully the French will remain the stalwarts that they actually were in the past on this and will keep the Biden administration on the straight and narrow that they were unable to keep the Obama administration on and that we we see them use this opportunity in a way that is productive rather than destructive. We are going to see. But meanwhile, let me just say the world is not no- mourning Mohsen Fakhrizada. Bye, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and bye to all of our, our listeners. Thank you so much for listening. Again, to, if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you are, please subscribe. Please rate us. Please tell your friends. If you're new to the podcast, we'd love to have you as a permanent listener. And if you're an old listener, tell everyone you know, because we've got great guests uh, like David Albright and others coming up uh, in the months ahead. Exactly. Take care, everyone. Bye. And our team here at AEI is Alexa Santry, Matt Winesett, Jen Moretta, and Macy Heath. Let us know what topics you'd like us to cover. You can get in touch with the show by emailing us at whatthehell at AEI.org. Or you can reach us on Twitter. I'm at D. Pletka. And I'm at Mark Thiessen. That's Mark with a C. Please rate and review the podcast. If you like the show, please subscribe, share it, comment on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you're listening to this. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.